तो ओके आई एम गोइंग आई एम अ सॉफ्टवेयर इंजीनियर एंड फंक्शनाइज यूएस बेस्ड कंपनी एंड आल्सो फाउंडर ऑफ ऑफिसी कनेक्स आई रन्स अ फिनेंस टेक एंड वाइज व्हिच वी टीच programming and coding for beginners in EM, mainland and also I run the Ruby and JavaScript data group in the island. We do it every month, so if you are keen to join, you can join. Um, so <coughs> today I'll be presenting on Flask app with uh, database. Okay. So um, the installation part, this is for you to kick start. So this is how you able to start if you are using a Windows machine. So for me, I'm using Linux, so I have not much problem to set up. If you are using Windows, you need to go through these steps. Um, there's a kit view library that you need to install from uh, UCI EDU. That's the only way you can start in Windows if you want to use a MySQL client, Python. Um, and also, we are using Docker for this one because you won't want to install a MySQL database on your laptop. You want to have a layer when you can just start and use it for your own. Okay, so a little brief background, what is Flask? So Flask is a web framework for Python for you to build your own website or API access point. So an API layer or a website layer using Python. Okay. So um, this is more on the workshop type of stuff. So um, this is how the Docker Compose looks like. So something bigger. Okay. So I'm using Docker Compose. As you can see that uh, there's a dependency. You have a DB and you have a add minor. So for DB part, you are using MySQL image, and then you have uh, your uh, username, password, and then the port that you expose to your environment, 3306. So, and also M minor. M minor is a program that able to access your MySQL database in the browser. Okay. So to start MySQL Docker, so um, you run Docker Compose dash f. Um, stack YAML up. So I can run it here. Docker compose F dash. So this is running Docker right now. So I'm running Docker on the background. As you can see, there's N minor, right? So I can access to N minor here. Compose. So this is how you can access your MySQL. If you want to do some modification, you don't want to get in the code and do stuff, you can access from here. So you do um, So this is how the schema looks like. Right? Okay. Here. So um, as a start, you just want to learn how to connect your Python a Flask app to your database. So you visit this local ADAD to go to the M minor and then create a database to call it uh, Flask example app. So from here, you can see that it's actually here already created. Normally, you just click create database and then you can create your own database here. Okay? And then uh, next one, you create some sample data. So um, create a table for example with an ID and description column and add three records. So from here, you see that's uh, so this one. We do this first. Okay, so you can see the database is empty, right? So <coughs> examples um, column, I need ID. The integer, it's auto increment, and description um, is the bar chart, put it 46, and then 
and a high speed rate of debug. Rate of debug using your uh, web uh, browser, right? So now we need to create uh, items. So implement with the pair, and then this is example one. Say that the third max is this example two. Okay, so we already insert two. Three records is done. Now, this is the part that we connect the Python to the MySQL. So, um, after you install MySQL client Python, you need to use import. Uh, is it clear from here? Yeah, can see clear. So, first you import the cursor and then you connect to the database. So, the database is hosted on your local host because you start up the browser. And then your username and password and your DB. Um, and I'm using cursor class because by default it's using a, it's not using a dictionary, so there's no key value. It's using an index. So like position zero is record one, position one is record two. But if you use cursor, it allows you to use key value for the stuff. Right. So you can run this. Python 3. Okay, um, so let me make it bigger for you. So you can see that after I run, uh, this is the record that I read. So for record number one, it, this is the example one, not the record number one, the ID one and two. So from, we, from here, we can see that. For each row, when we do a database fetch all, right, there's row. So for each row, you print out the ID, you print out the description. So this is a very simple way for you to attach your uh, Python to your MySQL. <coughs> so why I choose MySQL? Because I know a lot of people are using PHP and MySQL for like many years already. So people are familiar with MySQL. So if you have a MySQL database online, whatever in the cloud, you can just connect to a host and do this using Python, right? So it works with your existing um, uh, MySQL infrastructure, right? Okay. Now we go in for the uh, C. Create a database object. <coughs> what is a database object? <coughs> so a database object is a class where we abstract, like OP, we abstract the functions become a class, so we can use it when we need it. We don't want to repeat certainly doing certain stuff repeatedly, right? So first we define a class, we define all the properties. This can be put into a YAML file as a config. When you load the config, then it's load all these variables. For me, I just want simplicity, I just put it here, right? So you can have an init function. For each class, we do have an init function, when it is being initialized, uh, it will start up the connection, it will start up the, the cursor. And then there's an insert, there's a query, there's a delete. This is just to close the connection. So from here, it's just a Python class example. Right? So yes, we are going to create table with migration. So, if you work with database before you know migration, right? You need to create um, a script to run your migration, create tables and uh, schemas, right? For Python, uh, I'm doing a very simple way of doing it. There's tools to do migration, but I would not want to go that advanced or that deep because we don't need it for now. So this is how I do it. So um, I'm using sys Half append dot dot y because um, there's a folder you see the folder uh, arrangement migration is one left one folder deeper 
I want to access database, so I need to append dot dot so that I can go up one folder to find this database dot py, right? So same thing from database. So when I mention database here, it's actually database dot py. I import database with a capital D because this is actually the class. So from the file, I import the class. Okay. Same thing, I initiate the database, then I do the function db insert and then create users and stuff. You can do your own migrations, you can create multiple files and then just run the migration. <coughs> so for me, so I do migrations, then I search tree, uh, create. Okay. So is the table created? Let's see. Now the user is being created. Okay? This is just a, simple, a very easy way for get for you to get started rather than going through a very deep stuff. Like you don't want that. You just want to start using Python. Okay? <coughs> Next, what is this? Like create a path for register, login, logout. So now we want to use uh, our database in uh, our Flux app. So let's see. So this is more stuff here. Let's start with the uh, quite uh, easy, I guess. So you need to import Flask, Flash, redirect, render template, request, session, support. Maybe not using a bot. Uh, um, so same thing, you import database. First, you define your app and then app secret key. If you are using session, session here is actually cookies. You know browser cookies, right? So session is actually cookies that store in your browser. So you need to have a secret key so that it stays, stays encrypted. It's a requirement. Okay? And then define the database and then you route. So this route is actually your index route. So this is how Flask uh, define the path. So if you want to define an index path, you just put a slash and then you create, uh, you define a definition, a Python definition. This can be anything, it can be home, it can be just anything, it's just a method name. Okay? And then there's a function say that if there's a not login, then you will render template. What is render template? So render templates comes in here. Templates. The folder needs to be named exactly like this templates with the S. If you name differently, it doesn't work. So that's the convention for class. You need to name it templates. Okay? And then inside templates, you have login HTML. This is the login HTML. So the format is a bit different from um, normal HTML, right? You can see there's a block body, there's a uh, this kind of thing, the if thing, this is the uh, uh, Python stuff. So this is the Python uh, DSL, right? To um, render the HTML class. So you still have the HTML thing like the paragraph, the form, but you have you can put a Python uh, functions here, embedded Python functions to decide what to render. Okay. So next we have register. So this is different a bit, right? So you see here, register, you have get and post. So it behaves differently. So you can use the same um, path, the browser path, not browser, URL path to do different things. You, when it's using get for this path, you are rendering a HTML file, register HTML. If it's a post, it means you are sending data over. You are doing other stuff, right? You can, you are actually <coughs> doing research. <coughs> From here, I haven't care about SQL injection, so this is possible for SQL injection also. I didn't care about that because I just want to get started. You need to take care of your SQL injection. Don't do this, right? You can see it's prone to SQL injection. Yeah, just pop it in. Don't do this. This is just for you for kickstart. You need to know that SQL injection. This is going to SQL injection. Okay? 
Then um, after you register, right, you need to set the session to true. So it means you already log in. And then you add into the username. Else it says incomplete form. Means it's throw an error. Something wrong with the form. Right? It returns you to the index page. Okay? Log out is this. It just log you out. And then uh, log in is same as checking your password. Password, remember to hash it. Don't <coughs> save it as a clear text. Hash it. I'm not hashing it here because you get the idea. Don't do stupid stuff. Don't store your password in clear text. Hash it. Okay? Um, then this is straightforward for you to understand. Uh, once you log in, you check for password, check for username, whether the database has this column, uh, not column, have this row. If it's having this user, then you just set the login as true. So let's start the app. By starting an app is easy. You just Python CLI. So this is a Flash app. So it started at localhost 5000. Right? This is uh, go to localhost. <coughs> okay, there's no user right now, right? So you register ABC, <coughs> don't care, there's no validation. <coughs> so, hello, name, you are logged in. Okay, how to log up? So, you just basic log up. You have set how I define, or you can click the button or whatever. Depends how you want to implement. Just an example to show how you get in. Okay, so if you see, if you see, you get back in, you already log in. So, this is a very super um, simple example. You can modify the code um, here and then get started. Because I want to just teach you the basic, the concept of you just start a plus app. But there's a lot of things, a lot of plugins for plus application you can do. Like machine learning, if you want to do machine learning, you just mention about like here. You import a database, right? You just import your machine learning logic and then just throw in. It works. If you want to do an API, you also can. You just return a JSON file. Then you have your API on the plus app. So you don't need this render app template anymore because you are not posting, you are not returning a HTML, you just want to return a JSON. So this is very flexible, plus is very flexible for you to use as any cases, right? And then uh, to kill this application, just control C. You already kill this server. So that's the server is no more there, no longer there. No longer there. Okay? And uh, let's see what time. Uh, to shut down your Docker Compose, it's the same thing. Control C. You can see it starts to shut down. Right. So, why I use Docker Compose is uh, separate, like separate your application with whatever you want to set up because you don't want to waste time on configuring or setting up a uh, local environment. So, if you have Mac, you have Windows, you have Linux. How many times you want to set up certain things in different configuration? You don't want to do that. You just want a one file, one command line, everything's up. That's it. Start the development, do your things. Do things that's more important. Rather than wasting time configuring your development and all. Right? So uh, this is a very fast way to get started with Plus. Then let's go to the resource. This is the link that you can visit, or you can just simply Google for Python class. There's a lot of this stuff online, right? And then if this is my GitHub. You can fork it, uh, use it, modifying it, whatever. It's free to use, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, it's fast. It's still very early. Uh, any questions? <coughs> any questions? 
no question that I will be doing uh, uh, something. <coughs> so this is some marketing on the Penang Cat. Okay. So I create a website, a simple one. So this is the workshop has been done for previously in EM. I do data uh, analytics using Jupyter and also the past workshop. <coughs> so upcoming you can go and look at here if you want to see future events. The workshop is it won't be on island because island has so much things going on. It's only on mainland. If you want to learn something for free, go to mainland. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's just separating your app into different components, smaller modules that you can plug in and then duplicate. And do Flask and REST API to edit. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things for Flask you can look up. Yeah. Does it mean that if you run a Docker Compose, yeah. it's still a Docker container already in microservices? If you read up microservices, it's just services in multiple ways. Like how you want to lay out your microservices, you can have two databases and HA, and then front uh, API layer, you have three. It just depends how you want to separate your monolith application into smaller components so that you only focus on, focus on certain things when you want to do stuff rather than modify a very large code base. Right? So that's microservices. But now it's a hype, like everyone goes to microservices, but it depends on your business whether it's worth it or not. Sometimes you want to do simple things. Microservices is just a waste of time. Like you have one thousand customer, why you want to use a microservices? Just use a simple website, do your work. Unless you go for one billion or a few billion, I mean, then yeah, microservices make sense. But for start, just get your business up, get your product out. That's it, because your product will always change over time. So it's possible to set up master slave configuration in Docker. Yes, you can. It's just a, con it's just a. You know VPS, right? VPS. Uh, container is something like VPS, something like not really fully VPS. It's just separation uh, on the cloud. You can run, you can turn it down, you can turn it up very quickly. Later we go through actually, today we go through. Any other question? Okay. So, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Sujit and like I introduced
this first, I run the Docker Penang data to load. So, this will be a part of the session where I will be covering uh, how to run Django in a Docker container. And later on, we will talk more specifically about Docker. Okay? So, just to introduce who knows there is a Docker meetup going on, like who heard for the first time there, yes, there is a Docker meetup. First time. So, the first thing to do is like to get more uh, notification about the events happening in the future. Get registered over to events.docker.com. So, once you register, I will be sending out like monthly updates of what events are going to happen. So, the next major event that is going to happen in October is like there will be a hands on workshop where we will be starting from the basic Docker thing and go and build up a kind of a web application full scale which will have kind of a microservices pattern, interacts with CP and everything. So, make sure you get registered to events.docker.com. Okay? And we have a Twitter handle, Docker Penang. If you are on Twitter, please follow this. And I am also there on the Twitter with this handle, so you can join. Okay. So, uh, I am a Docker captain. Uh, like, Docker captains are recognized community members from the Docker company itself <coughs> who help to learn the, with the community teach what is the Docker technology. So at any point of time, if you have any doubts or questions related to Docker, you can tweet me directly, I can help you out here. Okay? For free? Yes, free. <laughs> <laughs> Did I charge you anything for this meetup? No. So what I expect in return is that if you learn something about Docker, please come up on stage and share that knowledge with other community members. That's what I expect. I don't expect any money from you in return. Okay? So who heard about Django? So for those who are new, it's a web framework which is available in Python where you can build up uh, web application. So fast, okay? Something similar to Flask, but it has more capabilities compared to uh, Flask. So what I'm going to do is, I, uh, if you hit this page, DangoProject.com, that's the basic uh, landing page if you search on Google for Django. And there is a tutorial which helps you with installation guide and write your first Django app. So I'm going to follow basic steps which is there in this play. Write your first Django app. Okay? So if you want to follow along with me, please do it. Because I'll be going by a slow pace. But you can ask me questions related to this and Docker. Great? <coughs> Is that visible? Okay. So on my machine, I have a Python version of 2.7. So when you start working with Python, make sure that uh, you don't work with the system installation of Python because let it there be for system related works. So the first way you do is like create a virtual environment within your machine. So I don't want to deal with the virtual environment thing, so what I will do is make it run in a Docker container. So first to start with Django, you need Django installed on your machine. So if I run this command on my machine, it says no module named Django. So the first thing I need to do is install Django on my machine. So what you could do is that pip install Django. I don't want to do it on my local machine. I want to keep my machine clean. So 
So I gave this talk, similar, same talk, uh, two weeks back in Kuala Lumpur, where we had a Python conference. And I gave the exact talk over there. Uh, if something doesn't work because I, I didn't reverse it exactly, I have kind of said what needs to be followed. Uh, if something breaks, you can solve it by just going along. Docker images tagged with different names. 
which are there for window as well as for dinner. So when I do a statement something like this, it will go and search for a alpine three dot base image, which is found from this place. Okay. And then I'm adding some uh, label kind of stuff, maintainer, just my name. And then I'm passing an argument, something called Django build version 2.1. Because uh, right now, Django, the latest version is 2.1. So I'm making use of latest Django version. <coughs> so I'm passing it as an argument over there. So I was sure why I made that as an argument. And then I'm defining just uh, Django version. Uh, these two variables are required uh, because when you run the Docker container, you want to see the logs, what's happening in the container. So that's the reason you specify this one. And this is because when you compile your Python code, a file called .pyc is generated. You don't want those stuff because it's compiled already. I want to keep my container clean, just the Python code over there. And I'm saying my working directory, which is kind of a folder in your container. I will show you how that looks. And then I say pip install Django, which is basically the step what you would do on your local machine. But rather than doing it on a local machine, what I'm doing is writing it in a Docker file and building a Docker image. <coughs> Doubts until this one. All clear? <coughs> you can shoot me questions anytime. Any doubts? If you ask me questions, that will be more interesting because it kind of feels bored when I talk and you just keep listening. <laughs> At least one question about this. So, uh, so yeah. So when I say Alpine three point eight, uh, that <coughs> is an Alpine based image which has been developed by Docker itself, and it has been released on Docker Hub. So I'm just consuming that. So that is already a Python image created using that Docker image. So you can build on uh, using referencing another image. So like I am referencing Python Alpine three point eight. So, so you want to see how to the Python image for the Yes. And what is 3.8? Is there is a So that is Alpine version which has been released. So let me show you the Docker file for this. So what I did is that I went into that this Docker image. So that how you create a Docker image, it's written in a Docker file. So I went into that Docker file, and if you see, it's using the Alpine 3.8 image. So the guy who created Python package for me, he tagged it as Alpine 3.8, saying that it is an identifier which is referencing Alpine as a base image and creating Python, adding this Python into it. Yep. So why should yeah, it's like very, very uh, kind of PyMB, which has a base uh, operating file system in it. Just yeah. So basically, Docker is the right? Yeah. So that means when so you add in the Alpine 3.8, basically 
if I start the time the, the longer uh, session now, it loads in the binary for the binary for three point five, right? Yeah, then right. if I stop my own machine, I go off, and then tomorrow I come back, I start the doctor thing here, what they call session, then it will load the binary with it, right? It, I won't say that the binary, uh, it's called a doctor image. Okay. Okay. So when you consume that image, when you execute the command <coughs> Docker run Alpine, let me show you. Okay, let me find my screen. So at the background, it did some work for me, but I couldn't notice what happened. So now what I'm doing is that I'm executing the same Alpine image and my command prompt changed, if you see. So I am into the container. And you see a file system which is there, which is Alpine based. So that means uh, Alpine 3.8, you can load up the container, but then we yeah. have to so, every time you start the document. So, so the reason it got spinned up so fast is that I have a list of whole Docker images on my machine. And if I grab Alpine, so I have a list of Alpine images. So it's consuming those images, so the which is there images on my system. Yes, it's getting it from the internet. No. Right? So the first time you run a Docker run command and the image which you are specifying, it searches first on your local system. Is that image available for me on my local system, Docker installation? If it doesn't find, it goes to the Docker Hub. It pulls it down. But if you are putting it on a local machine, mm -hmm. there's always a possibility that it may be outdated, right? Somebody yes. can change the Alpine 3.8 or the internet. Yes, that's a good question. So don't <laughs> use the latest tag over there. <coughs> so 3.8 specific version would be 3.8 only. But the, when they tag it as latest, they keep it on a latest kernel and something. Yeah, 3.9. Yeah, so do, when I, to learn for learning purpose, latest is okay. The tag which I'm saying. But be specific on the tag when you are pulling it down. Because once a Alpine 3. image has been released, there won't be any change until and unless any vulnerabilities is detected and they need to update it. And in that case, you would do is that Now, if you see on my screen, uh, what happened is that I removed the Alpine image from my local system. So when I did Docker full Alpine, it using default tag latest. So it was checking whether I have the latest Alpine on my system or not. <coughs> okay, it couldn't find because I deleted the Alpine image on my machine, and then it went and downloaded that image from Docker Hub. And there is a image ID which is generated for you, so that gives you a unique identifier for the Docker image. Yes. But if when you go in, it's like a Linux kind of. So you see, on my machine, the way to identify whether you have Docker running on is there would be a veil icon on your machine. So on your Windows system tray, you would find the same icon. So the container technology itself evolved from uh, Linux thing. So basically there is a VM running at the back end. So Mac kernel, the Linux kernel, and the Windows kernel are kind of three different kernel technologies. They don't understand each other. So container thing is basically evolved from uh, Linux thing. So when I spin up a container, it's kind of talking directly to my kernel. So if I run a uh, Linux kernel on Windows, it won't understand that language between the container and the uh, Windows kernel. 
So I need a Windows, a Linux VM running somewhere on my system. So even on my Mac, if you see, there is a VM running which has been, I have allocated a 64 GB disk and four CPUs and two GB of memory. <clears throat> so when I'm executing those Docker run commands and any Docker commands, it's actually being executed on this VM rather than being on my Mac. So basically, the Docker installation, what you have done, it makes it easy, it doesn't feel you whether you're working on Mac or Linux. So you don't have to do that. When you install Docker on your machine, it does all the work for you. You don't have to do it. You right, just right. click, yeah. So you just need, need to download the base, uh, let me show you where you can get that. <coughs> So I won't say, so but how I explain it to new beginners is that it is a VM, Linux VM. But if you go advanced into the container technology, Docker containers, there are Windows containers also. So Microsoft has brought in their own technology. So using Hyper-V, which is a virtualization available on Windows environment, you can run Windows container also which is directly talking to the Windows kernel rather than running a VM on your machine for Linux VM. So, if you are running on the Hyper-V, is there any performance gain if they are taking uh, So, if you are running on Windows 10, I wouldn't say there would be much performance gain. You have to go on Windows Server editions because 2016 is the basic thing to start with. And 2019, inside the preview, those are the latest Windows servers which support container technology. So if you run those things on that big servers, you will see. Uh, but the Hyper-V containers, if you spin up, you won't see much performance gain compared to a Linux container. Because when you load up the Hyper-V container, it's actually loading a full-blown operating system, Windows operating system, and then running a container for you. In this case, you are just running your application packages and the base operating system. Which is kind of a minimum. Okay, so when you download Docker for Windows and you install it, so the basic requirement for Docker for Windows is at least Windows 10. And if you install it on Windows 10, what you get is you get two choices. You can run Docker for Linux or Docker for Windows. There is a switch which you can turn on and off. So by default, it's on a Linux thing. So again, the same thing with what I showed you, there is a Linux VM running when you are running Linux containers on Windows. Cut. So I will say forget about that part right now to start with. So I have written my Docker file and I need Django installing it so that I can run Django in a container. So how would you build your Docker image for that? So I would say Docker you need to build your docker image so the command is docker build and I'm passing some build argument uh, 
Django build version is 2.1 because I need Django 2.1 and I am passing minus T so JQLA is like Django Alpine 3 dot so I am tagging my the image which will be generated on my machine I am tagging it as with this name something similar to what you saw on the logo file they tag their images as Python. So for me to identify that, once that image has been built, this is specific what this image would do. I am tagging it so that I can remember in the future. So the reason it executed so fast is because it has been cached on my system. Uh, let me show you how it would work. At any time, if you need a help about some specific Docker command, uh, just type Docker. So I need a help about build parameters. What are different parameters? So I would say Docker build help. So it would show me a list of what parameters it can accept. So there is this no cache. So let's try to use that one. So now when I pass that extra parameter no cache, what it is, did is, it didn't use the cache on my system. So rather than it is going on the internet and doing all the fresh copy of installation. So anytime you doubt that there has been some update on the Docker Hub, you uh, make use of hyphen iPhone no cache. So that means it won't use your local copy of images which has been downloaded already. So now it's collecting Django. So it's something like pip install Django. Installing Django within my Docker image and successfully build and tag that image as <coughs> case I need a Django 2.0 version okay so if I didn't make this as the argument uh, and one I every time I need to come and update this environment variable Django version which I am referencing over here okay so for this thing if I don't pass that 2.1 by default it would take this one but at the runtime, it says you, you need to build 2.0. So now it would go and install Django 2.0 for me. The that, the that has been overwritten for you from the command line. So that's the reason I passed explicitly for this. The argument passed from the document and you say the argument. Yes. Uh, and I think uh, what's the meaning of the environment of the file that I'm offered and the what's of the Yeah, Python and the file. So 
when you uh, try to build your Django app, uh, it compiles Python files for you. I think by default .pyc is what generated, which is a compiled form of your code, whatever you will be writing. So when I build my images, uh, I don't want those old stuff to be coming out into my Docker images. So I'm saying whatever .pyc is, please don't generate it for me. So you experience with Java or C, C++, compile a file, compile file. When you compile a file, there is a byte form of it generated. That is kind of a local for, which is local for your system to make that binary run. So I want to make sure everything in my Docker container is fresh for me, is generated fresh. So rather than using the stale thing which was generated on your local machine while doing the development, let it get generated in the Docker container itself on the runtime. So I'm saying don't use my local copy of byte files or .pyc files which has been generated. You have to mention the environment like this. Use the no. So what happens is that in that case it will copy the .pyc into your Docker image. I don't want that stale things to be into my Docker image. And the second environment thing is if you don't mention that, say when you build your application, you need to look into the logs what has been there. So if I do docker log, if I don't mention this python buffer thing, uh, when I do docker log command, it won't show you what is happening within the container. So to see that logs on my console, I'm saying, please use this command. Sure. All clear up until now. Don't be shy. So what happens when you do something on the computer and you shut it down? I'll show you. That's what I'm going to show. and attaching a terminal to it so that I can get into the container. So right now if you see my bash it has turned to slash code which means I am in the container and how this did slash code come in because <coughs> in docker file if you see <coughs> I mentioned my working directory as slash code so that when my container launches and I attach the terminal to it, my present working directory is slash code. No, I didn't say that go and go into the code folder. I, so my command was that docker run minus it give, give me an interactive terminal within the container using this image which was generated earlier and give me a shell sh so you can use bash zsh any terminal you want And 
if I go and execute the same command on my local box, it says no module named Django. So I got a Django installation running within a container. So I have an environment where Django is installed. That is within the container. So you have kept your local box isolated and you have kind of a virtual environment which is something there in the Python also. But this virtual environment is there for you within the container. So on my local box, I have a Python of 2.7 and if I do Python version, I have 3.7 within my container. <coughs> so if you are following the same tutorial, the after installing Django on your machine, the step, second step would be creating a Django project. So to create a Django project, you have a command Django admin start project and the project name. So I give it as a name Django. And you can see there is a folder created called Django. That is within the container. So I have a folder called demo and manage.py. Manage.py is your entry point to launch the Django app. So exactly similar structure what I've got within my container. Okay. Uh, you can read about what are the various files in this. This is a description of the <coughs> I'm not going to talk about that thing. So with the basic project structures uh, generated, you can launch the Django app with this command, Python manage py run server. Running at the port HTTP 127.0.0.8000. Okay, so there is a web server running within the container. So, by logic, if you hit this URL, you should see something. <coughs> but I don't see anything. Django which is running on your box is in an isolated environment. It doesn't know what is happening outside of that box what is running which is the container. So that port 8000 which has been exposed is within that container only. So no process on your host can access directly any resources running in your container. So I need to make that thing happen. 
I'll show you how to make that. So the reason you didn't see when I hit local host 8000 something gave me 404 error is because that process is running as an isolated process in a container which is not directly accessible by the system. So we need to make two things happen, make this app accessible on my host and I want the code to be there on my local box to write something new code because that structure which got generated is a basic structure for you. So right now I am still within the container, I am not, so if I do exit I still see only Docker file on my machine. Okay? And if I run the same command again <coughs> and I do ls, I don't see the demo folder which was created earlier. Because what happened is that when you exited the container, it got killed and everything data which got generated within that container vanished. So, the container is not a stateful thing. So, whatever you create within your container has a life cycle only until when it runs. As soon as it exits, it's cleared out of the system. Okay? So, don't save your data, application related data within the container because the container which gets spun up has only a read-only file system. It's not persisted for you. So make sure when you're developing application with Docker container, you don't save anything within the container. So how could we solve that problem? So now what I'm doing is that if you see my docker run command, it got some extra parameters than earlier thing. So earlier my command was this one, docker run minus it, I went into the container, did some work within the container to create the project structure. So rather than doing that, what I'm saying is that use the same alpine image which has Django installed it, but I'm saying passing some extra parameter over here. So minus P is, I'm saying mount a volume for me. Dollar PWD is your current present working directory. So I'm saying whatever folder I am in right now, mount it into slash code. Slash code is a folder which is inside the container for you. Okay? And then I'm passing some extra parameter Django admin start project demo, which is something the basic same command which I executed within the container. So the container spinned up, it did my work for me and it got exited. So to see what containers are running on your system, you can see something like this, Docker PS something similar to PS, process state command in Linux. If you do docker PS, it shows you what containers are running on your system. So I have only one alpine which is, is having this ID, I can do docker stop ID. If you see now, I got a demo folder created on my local 
stocks, which was something earlier you saw creating trade got created within the container. So what made that difference? Bringing that folder into my local box is this extra parameter what you see on the Docker run command. So it mounted my present working directory into that container and when that container got stopped because it's kind of a mirroring those things onto your local file system. <coughs> and if you see it's the same similar structure what you see on the top Django So what I did is that without having Django installed on my local box, I got a Django project set up on my box. Okay, running in a Docker container. So can you at least the file locally and get the success? If you do any changes over here, right now it's only within my local system because I don't have any container running and attach that volume into the container. I will show you how that got gets successful. So when my application ran within the container on port 8000, I was not able to access that yet. So I want to make it accessible from the <coughs> container to my local host. <coughs> so how you would achieve is you add this extra statement at the top bottom, expose 8000. So it's kind of an instruction saying to the container saying that when you have any process started up which is using port 8000, please expose it so that any process from my local box can access that application which is running in the container. So, so that means the port 8000 once you serve it in the container, your local host cannot have another machine running the port 8000. In the container you can access, run it as many times as you want. But when you consume that port 8000 on your local host, Local box, it's only one time. So I will show you how to do that. There's no conflict. So I'm saying within the container, no conflict. As many times you can use it. Because my process, when it starts up and using port 8000, it's an isolated process, which is running multiple times. So you can, within the container, you can have as many times as you want. But on your local box, you can mount only once. I will show you how to do that. No, I mean, existingly, let's say my local box, I already have a web server set up for 40,000, mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. right. then that wouldn't work. So that I will show you what command to use for that. So I'm adding only <coughs> one instruction saying that port 8000 should be exposed. So when I change my Docker file, you need to rebuild your image again. Else that changes what you did in the Docker file won't come up into your Docker image. So nothing new, only added a statement and this was exposed to it further. Now the reason I added exposed 8000 at the bottom is that if I would have added that similar, you can place it anywhere you want. But if I suppose say added over here, so when I said each instruction in that Docker file is a layer for you, which is a read-only file system. So, if I place at the bottom the layers which were already created, I'm not changing anything in them. So, 
when you build your Docker image next time, it will already have those things cached. And I'm adding only one layer at the top. <coughs> like you see it is upside down. So I'm changing only one layer, which is at the bottom. So only one layer has been changed in the name. So the reason I didn't put over here is that if I put in between, it would ch change all my layers file system which is being created in the container. So I don't want that thing to happen. So that's why I placed it at the bottom. So I'm running the same application again within the container now after adding the statement expose 8000. So uh, what I did mistake is that when I previously ran, I didn't specify which interface to use. Uh, so I passed some extra parameter 0, .0, 0.0.0, which is like bind all the interfaces on my what is available <coughs> to port 8000. And if you see my Docker run command, it has it got some extra parameters minus p 8000. So now what? How I access that application is that I added the statement expose 8000 and then I need to access that application. So to answer your question now, I already have port 8000 in front being consumed. Okay? So it would say port 8000 on my host has already been the earlier command used it. So if I need to access the same application on a different port, I would say 8001 and I would say Python manage Okay. 
but within the container it's still 8000 okay so on your host it's the same protocol remains it doesn't get changed but within the container you can receive use the same code <coughs> you have like mounted and then the second time I'm not using the mount the file system on your local should be there the second time if you're not using the mount because that was a previous execution Do you want a break or or should I continue? Break. Break. Okay, we take a we come back to twelve. It's eleven forty eight now. <laughs> 